Shalom, brothers and sisters, and welcome to this week's Sabbath service. We're going to start off by reading chapter 7 from the book of the Law of the Lord. When in blessing the Lord thy God shall bestow upon thee any great and choice blessing, or in his abundant charity shall deliver thee from any great calamity, thou shalt assemble together thy wives and thy children, thy friends and thy neighbors, and shalt celebrate his glorious goodness with thank offerings, and feasting, and music, and dancing. And for the chief blessings of God to thee, thou shalt keep it in remembrance from year to year, and teach it to thy children, that they who inherit the blessing may not forget gratitude to the giver, and the remembrance of the goodness of thy God be preserved throughout all generations. By way of announcement, I want to mention two things. One is, because of the holiday season, I want to let you know up front, the rest of this month and December, and possibly the first week of January, I don't know yet, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of things with family, which requires me to travel. So I, I was gone very early yesterday. It was back until late, and so I'm actually recording this Sunday morning. So if this isn't if, if these videos become something it's just me in the car or me doing something rather quick i want you to know i'm trying my best to provide you with a service a worship service but if i run out of time it may not be what you're used to and i'm, I'm hoping and i'm prayerful that you guys can forgive me and that it will still meet your spiritual needs but i'm going to do my best to continue to provide for you while at the same time being there and providing for my family. So, that said, the other thing I want to mention, I'll be mentioning this hopefully in every video going forward for the rest of the year. The way that I do these videos, I've mentioned this before, I get up Saturday mornings and I record the videos, and then um, I set them up so that they'll play live at 10 a.m. on Sundays. I've been praying on this, and I've talked to a couple of people about this idea, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's something anyone is interested in or not, but I'm basically going to start inviting everyone to the recordings. So, starting in January, and I'm not sure, it may not be until the second Saturday in January, but it'll be on the calendar, and you will be able to come and basically be there while I'm recording this, so we can have a true worship service on, on the Sabbath. If you're interested, if you are interested, please let me know ahead of time if you're planning on coming. You don't have to let me know. You can just show up. But if you would let me know, then um, one of the things I'm trying to figure out is whether to do this at 8 or 8.30. 8 o'clock gives me more time to get things done, but it's just, either way, it's just really, really early. 8.30 gives me a little bit more time to prepare myself for the services. But I've got to get these things done by a certain time because I have to actually edit the videos. And so my goal is to be done with all of this by noon. And that doesn't always happen even when I start at 7 or 8 o'clock in the morning. So if you would like to come and participate, let me know that you're interested. And let me know if you would prefer 8 or 8.30. And, I, and I, it's a 30-minute difference. So I don't mind catering to, to you and those that say something. The squeaky oil... I'm sorry, the squeaky wheel wheel will get the oil there. Beyond that, uh, I, I just really wanted to make this more open. I want to, I, I don't really like the fact, as you guys know, that this is just me in the recording. So if there's other people here, you can participate. You can not participate. That's entirely up to you. If you listen to some of the older recordings, and some of them are people that interrupt while I'm sharing a message, which it's, it's fine. You know, make conversation. So... As we're moving forward, these are, are two things that we're moving in, in this direction. Uh, the other announcement that I want to make is we as a fellowship need your prayers. We are currently preparing to print the plates of brass. We're done with the, ed I'm done with my edits, I should say. I sent it out to a couple different people to do their edits. We are going to print, I believe, five copies to send out to the editors. I'm going to print one copy first to make sure that everything looks correct, and then I'll print five. Send them out to the editors, and uh, then we'll do one last deep dive edit, if you will. 
and hopefully then we can have this book available for you in uh, Kindle, Nook, other electronic formats, hardback and paperback so that you guys can read and study it and uh, at that point we'll also replace the version that's on the website right now with a properly edited version instead of the one that's there now. Um, so please pray for us on that. Please pray for us on the temple. And as always, if you can donate to the cause, it's, it's fellowship money that we're using to pay for these edits the and the, these editing editions. And we would like to be able to buy several copies up front because, as I said before, if I can sell them on a fellowship store, which I'm still putting together, we can get them to you at a lower cost than going through our publisher. Our publisher has to have them higher because of the fact that we do sell them on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all the other major outlets. And so they have us crank the price up because we have to pay them to be in that service. So if we can offer them to you directly at a lower price, that would be wonderful. But in order to do that, we need people to either purchase them now or donate money so that we can do that. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing one uh, through us at the, at the lower price, it would probably save you like five bucks. I don't know yet, but on average, it seems to be looking at as putting the store together. We will save people on average of three to five dollars, which to me, that adds up. Um, then let me know and we can see about, you know, if you, if you donate to the fund a certain amount, then you can be pre-ordering a book, maybe. So, sorry, a bit of rambling there. Um, going into prayer requests. Uh, my father has been suffering from pneumonia for quite some time now. Uh, his health is not doing well, so I would appreciate your prayers there. Uh, also, the rest of my family, uh, <laughs> when you have a large family, I was going to say they've gotten well. The ones that were sick have gotten well, but some others have gotten sick. Um, so please pray for them. In case you're wondering, yes, I do give people blessings, but it doesn't always mean that the Lord wants everyone healed right now. So when I give a blessing, I try to seek the Lord's will and not just go about healing everyone. And I do think that one of the reasons why the Lord doesn't just instantly heal everybody through the priesthood is because it gives us an opportunity to pray for one another. It gives us an opportunity for service for one another, which is growth. So please pray for the sick. There are some other people that have called in for prayer requests. And yes, in case you're wondering, I am working on putting up a prayer request function on the website. I've just been really, really busy. I'd really like to get that up, especially if we're able to move into a point to where someone else takes over these services and they can just read the prayer requests. Um, but we do have several people that are sick. We have some people that are looking for jobs. We have some people that are traveling. Please pray for these brothers and sisters. We also have brothers and sisters that have recovered. We have brothers and sisters that have come to Christ for the first time. We have brothers and sisters that are finding the fellowship for the first time. And so let's say prayers of thanks to rejoice with you people oh, and, and uh, brothers and sisters who have received new jobs. As usual, our constant battle is with, with loneliness. So we're a fellowship. That, the whole point of this is to get people out of their shells to come forward and, and fellowship one with another so that we can have a sense of community. And, and I've talked about this in other videos. We know that there are those that aren't ready for that yet. Let's pray for these brothers and sisters. Let's pray for those that are seeking what we're offering. And let's pray for those that are still suffering from spiritual PTSD, that the Lord can help provide them the, the grace to heal so that we can begin growing this fellowship and, and truly be a fellowship and not just uh, everybody kind of talk to Dave when they need to talk to somebody. I, I appreciate your calls. I really do. I, I, I don't want that to stop. I just want more. I, I want other people to, to converse with one another so that we can truly fellowship with one another and not just everybody fellowship with, with Dave. I hope that makes sense. It doesn't sound rude, but it is what it is. 
So with that, let's take a moment to pause the video, say an opening prayer, sing a hymn, and we'll be here when you get back. And now for the unity portion of the service, I am going to read the Shema. In case you're wondering, when I read the Shema, it is live every time. I, it's not pre-recorded. Uh, this prayer is very special and very important to me. We're instructed to read it by the Lord in the Torah. And I just feel that us understanding that God is unity can help unite us as a people because if we are to emulate the Creator, then we as a creation must be unity also. So, with that, I'm going to read the Shema in Hebrew, and then I'm going to read it in English. And then I'm going to pause so that you have an opportunity to read it back together. And when this video plays live, I will be reading it with you. Shema Yisrael, Yiva Eloheno, Yiva Echad. Hero Israel, Yavah is our Elohim. Yavah is unity. With Thanksgiving being this coming week, I wanted to talk about thankfulness. I prayerfully sought which scripture to use, and I really felt impressed by the Spirit to use the Book of the Law of the Lord. And I know there's a lot of really good scriptures in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon about thankfulness. And I typically try to stick to the Bible and the Book of Mormon because those are the two books of scripture that we, as Latter-day Saints, universally accept. I know a lot of people aren't very familiar with the Book of the Law of the Lord. I know from the reaction of my testimony on James Strang, there are people who don't believe that he was a prophet and that this book is scripture. But it is canon for the fellowship. You don't have to accept it as scripture, but we do, collectively. We voted unanimously on it. No one voted against it. There were uh, there were around 100 votes, if I remember correctly, all over the world that voted uh, to canonize this for, for our movement. And, and I'm sure that some of them did vote that way simply because they want to be able to unify the saints and not necessarily because they believe the scripture, and that's okay. But I think that it is good to reach out, reach across the, across the aisle, so to speak, to the various branches. And so I, I don't see any harm in doing this every now and then and, and introducing people to new scripture that is taken very seriously in other parts of our movement. And I do have a testimony of the book of all the Lord is scripture. And the other reason why I feel that the Lord placed this particular scripture on my heart is because it goes through in a way that expresses the idea of a reoccurring, a reoccurring theme of thankfulness in celebration. It's an instruction on what to do and how to do it. There are a few countries that have a Thanksgiving. I know Canada has one. Obviously, in the United States, we have one. And so I guess I should have said at the beginning of the video that uh, this week is Thanksgiving in the United States of America. It is not Thanksgiving, obviously, worldwide. But it is still a universal topic. And I do believe that we should have a yearly celebration where we are thankful for things. Thanksgiving is not my favorite holiday because, to be quite frank, I do not like turkey. But I do love getting together with my family, my extended family, and talking about things that we are thankful for. And yes, we can do that during Sukkot and, and other biblical holy days. But this scripture really does impress upon my mind the need to go outside the box and have other family celebrations. We can do more than what the scriptures provide. The scriptures provide a starting point of equality for all of us as saints and instructions on what to do. Beyond that, we do as the Lord calls us and moves us to do as families, as individuals, and as communities. And in the United States of America and in Canada and other countries, we have chosen to be thankful one day out of every year. And I'm not going to get into the commercialism of it because that's not what this is about. But I do want to go through 
a couple thoughts that I've had this week about Thanksgiving. And I want to do this while going over the scripture. The first thing that comes to my mind here, it says, When in blessing, the Lord shall bestow upon thee any great and choice blessing. Or in his abundant charity shall deliver thee from a great calamity. So basically, whenever something good happens. I talk to a lot of atheists. I talk to probably well, not as many of the atheists as I do Latter-day Saints and other Christians and other, from other faiths. But particularly Latter-day Saints that have left the movement, they love to war against God. Not, not, not to generally speaking, that's, that's obviously not all of them do. Uh, my dad's a great example of, of one who left, didn't look back, and has absolutely no interest in evangelizing his new religion. And yes, I do believe that atheism is a religion because it is a system of beliefs. And the one thing that all atheists have in common is the belief that there is no God. Just like every Christian has the, the core understanding, the core belief, the shared belief that Jesus is the Christ. Beyond that, it's going to be different, but there we have it. So, I like to classify atheists into three different camps. And when I say that, these are generalizations. I want to be clear on that. And these generalizations, they overlap. You can have some atheists that are, you know, this type of atheist only, this type of atheist only, and this type of atheist only. And then you can have like that Venn diagram where you have like maybe all three or whatever, you know, existing in all of them. The first type of atheist is what I like to call the agnostic atheist. Maybe there is a God. They just don't care. Maybe they firmly believe that there is no God, but they just don't care to teach other people. So, you know, I was mentioning my father a minute ago. In my mind, he would go into that, that camp. Um, maybe there is a God. If it is, he's probably a bad guy. But there most likely isn't. And either way, I have absolutely no, in or he, I shouldn't say I, he has no interest in going around converting people to his beliefs. He believes everyone should have the freedom to believe whatever they want. So he's very agnostic about it. Then you have what I like to call the evangelical atheists. And these are the ones I generally run into online. These are the ones who believe very firmly in their new religion. They get very offended when I call it a religion. But it is a system of beliefs because I can't prove to anyone that God is real and they can't prove to anyone that God isn't real. I, I always tell people I can introduce you to God, but you have to build that relationship yourself. So these are the ones that like to go out and, and promote what they believe, tear down the beliefs of others and encourage others to join their religion. It's definitely not a church. I mean, there are some humanist groups out there who you know, get together. And I would say that, that those could be considered atheist churches if you want to. But there's a difference to me between a church and a religion. To me, a religion is a way of life. It's, it's, it's who you are internally and, and how you set your moral compass. Whereas a church, and then speaking of the churches of men, is someone who's telling people, hey, I've set up this system of beliefs, and if you agree with them, you come and be a part of us. And if you don't, take a hike. So there's a big difference between a church and a religion in my mind. The third type is what I like to call the born-again atheists. These are the ones who, maybe they have a bad impression of Christianity. They don't understand Christianity. They, they see Christianity as a biased group of people that hates the LGBTQ community, that hates minorities. You know, Basically, they only see the really vocal Christians that are very angry and, and not, I'm sorry, but not very Christ-like in my opinion. And they just judge all Christians based on those people. But in their hearts, they are truly good people. They have been born again, but they don't understand the reality of Jesus Christ. They don't realize that the way that they're living their life is the Christian way. I've said this before, and say it again. It's the example of Jesus talking in 3 Nephi when he said that the Holy Ghost fell upon the Lamanites and they knew it not. In uh, Doctrine of Saints 72, which would be Doctrine and Covenants 76. The Lord talks about those who would join if they properly understood or if they knew that they, they would join the kingdom of God. 
And so in my mind, these people are in spirit born again, in spirit members of the kingdom, but intellectually they just don't know that because they, they don't have a proper understanding of what Christianity is really about, and they misunderstand the true nature of God. And again, people can flow into any one of these. You can be an evangelical Christian, and you can be um, a born again. I'm sorry, you can be an evangelical atheist, and you can be a born again atheist. You can be a born again atheist, and you can be an agnostic atheist. You, you, know, you have that Venn diagram there where people kind of flow through these. So you're probably wondering, Dave, that's very interesting. That's, that's fascinating what you think about atheists, but what on earth does that have to do with Thanksgiving? Well, I was thinking, what is it that really separates us from atheists, especially the really good atheists, the born again atheists? If, if you know, we have bad evangelical Christians, we have agnostic Christians, we have born again Christians who are out trying to heal the creation, trying to love their neighbors. When I say born again, I don't mean that just as a title, I mean as their actions, just to, be, just to clarify there. So, what, what, what does it matter? What's the difference? Well, I, I think the biggest difference in my mind, in reality, between Christians and atheists is that we know who to thank. And I would say that not just of us, but anyone that has any sort of religion, they know that there is some sort of God there to thank when good things happen. Whereas atheists, it's a mystery. It's a coincidence. It was going to happen no matter what. It was destiny. It was luck. It's anything but God. And that, to me, is one of the reasons why I wanted to share this scripture with you. Because it's very important to me that you understand that God is not a genie. He doesn't just grant our wishes. God does not exist to serve us like that. God knows better than we do. He knows more than we do. And because he has that greater understanding, that infinite understanding, when things go the way that they go, we know that God is looking out for us, even if it seems like he isn't. We know who to thank when the blessings fall upon us. And so I, I think that this whole idea, this is in, it's basically the first half of the first verse of chapter seven in the fellowship canonization. It would be verse, verse 1a and b. But it's going over this, 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 this reality that God blesses us in his abundant charity, delivering us from great calamities. I've told you guys before the story, I, I was trying to be a nice guy. I was taking this girl home or to somebody's house or taking her wherever I was taking her. I was supposed to drop her off. And the Lord told me, do not take her here. And it just seemed like such a small thing. But I found out later that if I would have dropped her off there, I could have gone to prison. The Lord blessed me. I avoided calamity and I, I knew to listen and I knew who to thank. I think that we as Christians need to be more appreciative of that reality, that we know the source of all goodness, the source of all light, where all of our blessings come from. It's not a mystery to us because we know the reality of God. And I, I truly think that that is something that we need to be more thankful for. And, and you know, I, I could probably end the message right there because... That is the point. Everything I'm going to talk about going forward in this message, it's all about recognizing the reality of God, knowing the goodness of God, and in turn, taking the time to say thank you. Remember the stories of Jesus in the New Testament when he would perform a miracle? There's one, I believe it was 10 blind men. I'm going off my memory, so if I'm wrong, I apologize. But I believe it was 10 blind men. He sent them off. Maybe they were lepers, but he sent them off. And only one came back to thank him. He said, where, where are the others? They were all healed. But only one came back to say thank you. When the Lord blesses us, do we take the time to rejoice? Do we take the time to thank God for the good things that have been provided for us? 
I know I complain a bit about you know, wanting to have more time to spend with my family, but one of the greatest blessings the Lord has given me is time. Yes, my time is short, my time is compact, but yet somehow the Lord blesses me with the time to go and travel and spend time with, yesterday I was with my wife's family, you know, obviously with my kids, and I spent the whole day with family. It was wonderful. And yet the Lord still made sure that I had the time to record this message for you this morning and for me. That's a blessing that I am grateful for. So, don't ever judge our atheist brothers and sisters. Be thankful that we know and have the opportunity to thank God for the blessings that have been bestowed upon us. Which leads into 1C, the second half or the third part, based on this amount of words, it's really the second half, of verse 1. Thou shalt assemble together thy wives and thy children, thy friends and thy neighbors, and shalt celebrate his glorious goodness with thank offerings and feasting and music and dancing. Now, the fact that it says wives and children, obviously you could jump in and say, oh, polygamy, but you could also say this means it's a community, like the family gathering. Yesterday, when I was there with we were there. I was there with my wife and my children, but we were there collectively with our the men with our wives and the wives with their husbands. Friends, neighbors, other people in the community, other people in your, your social circle. And celebrate the glorious goodness of God with thank offerings. That's usually food, but it can also be gifts to other people. Feasting, music, and dancing. And by the way, this is one of the reasons, I know there's Christians out there who don't like to celebrate Christians. I'm sorry. I know there are Christians out there that don't like to celebrate Christmas. But this verse right here, to me, is an excellent example of why we celebrate Christmas. It's an opportunity to be thankful. It's another thanksgiving. It's an opportunity to offer thank offerings, gifts to other people, to love our neighbors and show that love through the spirit of giving. And of course, I'm never going to turn down an opportunity to worship Jesus Christ, remember Jesus Christ, and be thankful for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're being told here to get together, to collect together, to gather together, and to celebrate with thanks offerings, feastings, music, and dancing. I, I don't see anything wrong with any of that. I think it's wonderful, and I think we need to do it more. I think we should celebrate God more. I think the reason why we do these Sabbath worship services is because it's what we're used to. It's what we've been doing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Is there another way? Is there a better way to do it in Thanksgiving? I don't know. I mean, we're online right now, so maybe this is the only way we can do it. But one of the things I feel is being restored through the restoration of all things is the reality of dance as a form of worship. Is dance as a form of prophecy and revelation. Hymns and singing, and not, not just being entertained by musicians, but together as a group, singing in harmony. I've been to a couple different churches that have had special moments, whether it's a worship service or just a, a different type of gathering, where for an entire hour, sometimes two, the whole point is basically to do what I like to call a hymn testimony where you get up and you say I like this hymn this is why very quickly and then together as a congregation we all share and sing in that hymn they are beautiful services wonderful opportunities for us to in Thanksgiving share testimony bear testimony and sing I know that's really impossible for us to do right now the way that we interact with one another online. But I'm really looking forward to having a temple so that we can do these types of services together. So verse 2, it says, And for the chief blessing of God to thee, thou shalt keep it in remembrance from year to year and teach it to thy children. Now this goes back to the traditional Christian holidays. Was Jesus born on December 25th? 
I don't care. I'll talk about that more next month probably, but at the end of the day, I genuinely don't care. I've seen the logic behind it. Sure, why not? If you want to believe that, that's great. If you don't, sure, why not? If you want to believe that, that's great too. But what Christmas is about is a universal opportunity worldwide for us to teach our children about the blessings of God, the blessings of giving, the blessings and joy of receiving. It is exactly that, verse 2a. It's one that is celebrated in nearly every country. We have Thanksgiving, we have Easter, we have these various times throughout the year, Pentecost, that some of them coincide with, and so we need to wrap them up, in my, in my mind, I, I'm not saying you have to do this, but in my mind, we need to wrap them up with the original holy days that the Lord asked us to have. And in a sense, we're as Christians, it's always been doing them because of the fact that we wrap them up in new Christian realities. But these are a fulfillment of this commandment in the book of the law of the Lord. Let's stop attacking opportunities to worship Christ together. And let's be thankful and grateful that we have these times to do so. To be that they who inherit the blessings may not forget gratitude to the giver and the remembrance of the goodness of thy God be preserved throughout all generations. That goes right back up to the beginning of the first verse. That we need to remember who it is that blessed us, where these blessings came from. We have a sacred truth. And with that sacred truth comes a number of sacred responsibilities. One of those responsibilities, brothers and sisters, is to be thankful, to be grateful, and to take the time to teach our children who to be thankful for the blessings we have received. Who to be thankful to the blessings that we have received. That is my message for you this week, and I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are now going to offer an opportunity for you to partake in the sacrament of communion. We're going to first play a recording of myself reading our statement on communion. And then Christine is going to offer both of the communion prayers. And then there'll be an opportunity for you to pause the video to partake of the sacrament of communion in remembrance of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Once you've taken the sacrament, please take a moment to meditate upon that atonement. And then when you're ready, we'll be here to move forward with the rest of the service. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his Spirit to be with them. Amen.
Thank you for coming today and taking the time to worship with us. I hope that you've made it this far. I, I watch, I look at the statistics. I know a lot of people usually turn the video off after the the message. But if you've stayed this far, I, I want you to know that I really appreciate it. Please take the time to like the video and share it if you did enjoy it. I know that there are a lot of people out there that are, are seeking. We have a lot of seekers and they don't know where to find. And you sharing these videos plants a seed for these brothers and sisters to know that there is a safe place they can come to Christ, either as part of a ecumenical movement or if they are spiritually homeless and they are seeking shelter as a part of the greater church of Jesus Christ. If you haven't yet, on cjccf.org, we do have a spot where you can click to join. And beginning next year, we will be returning to sending out newsletters, making sure people know about the various events that are happening, and keeping people informed as to what we're doing and how they can help and get involved should they choose to do so. Again, thank you for coming this week. I am now going to offer a closing prayer. Elohim Shaddai, we bow our heads before thee at this time to thank you for all your many blessings. And we wish to thank you for the opportunity that we have in the various parts of the world that celebrate Thanksgiving, that we have a day where the majority of people have the opportunity to take time off work, to gather together with our families, with our friends, with our neighbors, with our loved ones, and be thankful for your blessings. Be grateful for your opportunities. We thank you, we thank you that you have enlightened our minds, enlightened our spirits, birthed our souls, so that we know who to thank. We know where our blessings come from. Please help us as we grow that we can shed the shackles of mere intellectualism and return to a greater spiritual understanding Academia is wonderful. Without spiritual light and knowledge, without the gift of the Holy Spirit, it can become burdensome and even irrelevant. So we thank you for your spiritual guidance, for the gift of the spirit of prophecy and revelation that you blessed us with through the Holy Ghost, through the power of the Book of Mormon. We thank you for all of the prophets and prophetesses over the centuries that have learned from you personally, from the Holy Spirit, and shared their words. And we thank you for the outpouring of revelation and scripture that we have today during the restoration of all things. We ask that you please bless us, enlighten our minds, not merely intellectually. We do wish to be blessed intellectually. We also endeavor and, and desire to be blessed spiritually, that we will know what to do with the knowledge of intellectualism through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, that together through this knowledge and this wisdom we will gain proper understanding of your will that we will know how to move away from the churches of men, the creeds of men, and to the kingdom of God, that we will know how to better gather in your name. You've asked us to do many things. You've asked us to gather people. You've asked us to build temples. And we do desire to do this. We need your help. We need the intellectual knowledge we need the spiritual wisdom, and we need the understanding that can only be gained through the mercy of Jesus Christ and through the strength of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Ghost in our lives.
We're so grateful and so thankful for all of your blessings. Please continue to bless us as we move forward in faith. Help us to find the strength, courage, and conviction once we know how to do your will to ensure that your will is done. Please bless us with the people that we need and please bless those people that are in need. That we can fellowship together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. So mote it be. Amen.